Hi, this is Pastor Bob. Today is number two, and let's take the complicated and make it simple. We're talking about 1 John 1, 9 in comparison to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. As a sinner, we confess the Lordship of Jesus. As a Christian, we confess our sins. Why can we do that? Because we're now priests. It's impossible for 1 John 1, 9 to be talking to sinners because sinners aren't priests. Only a priest can confess his sins. Sound wonderful? It is. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome back to Student of the Word. And today we are in part two of taking and making the complicated simple. And the main thing we're talking about is the complication of something so simple in 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9 is written to believers. The whole book was written to believers. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John were written to believers. In fact, that's the offer we are making on the broadcast here is that you can have a flash drive of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I highly recommend that you listen to these in your car. That's one of the best places to listen. And again, it's kind of that dead time. Going to the office and back, you know, is just dead time. And we usually listen to talk radio or classic rock or country and western or something. We had the same songs over and over again. And the news is the same thing over and over again. But the word of God that lives and abides forever will change you. And why not take that dead time and listen to the word of God? This is a great one to listen to in the car. So I highly admonish you to do that when the announcer comes on here at halftime, he will tell you how you can have a copy of it for yourself. We're talking about, again, 1 John 1, 9, the confession of sins. And this has become so distorted today that people take the plan of salvation, simply say, well, God removed all your sins. Yes, that's to get you into heaven. But there are sins that you commit in life as a Christian. And when you do, you're called a carnal Christian. You're not called a sinner. In other words, sinners sin and Christians sin, but how we approach the Lord over each of them is different. The sins you've committed as a sinner, don't even think about that. Come and do one thing, give your life to Jesus Christ. As a sinner, you come and you give your life to Jesus Christ, confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, and your sins are forgiven. But after that, you become a priest. Only a priest can approach the throne of God with their sins. Three things that priests do. Praise and worship is one of them, and prayer, and also confession of sins. These are the three things that as a believer and as a priest, you have a right to come before the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why 1 John 1, 9 could not possibly be written to a sinner. It has to be written to a believer. If we, we who are already saved and we who are already a priest before our heavenly father and our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, if we confess our sins, individual sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, sins as a sinner that are removed now allow you to go to heaven. But as a believer, they keep you from attacks of Satan, sickness, the problems of life. Oh, you still have them. But as a believer who's confessed his sins, you know good and well God's going to get you out of this thing. And if you if simply buck up and decide, uh uh-uh, it wasn't that bad. I, I think I'll just, I don't need to confess that. In fact, I feel justified in what I did. God's going to simply say, you know what? You just left the door wide open for Satan to attack you, the problems of life to attack you. And you know what? I can't deliver you while this is going on in your life. So again, we've looked at a lot of scripture, Old Testament and New, that line up with 1 John 1, 9, because the common problem here is that people say, well, look, 1 John 1, 9, how could it mean that's the only scripture in the entire Bible that says we need to confess our sins? Well, it's not. We're told in Proverbs to not only confess our sins, but to turn from it, run from it, and so distance ourselves from it. And we find examples in the Old Testament. David confessed his sins. I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said, your sin is forgiven. That's with Ian Bathsheba, and you will not die. New Testament, 1 John 1, 9, New Testament, we have in Acts 19, and the revival at Ephesus, it says, and many who believed came and confess their sins. So these are believers that when the revival broke out, became very, very convicted and came and confessed their sins of consulting with demons, consulting with witchcraft and all this. And they burned their books in front of everybody and their sins, individual sins were forgiven. But we also see the story of the prodigal. 
And the prodigal, after running from his father, taking his uh, wealth and running and squandering it and spending it on harlots and, and drunkenness and all this and laying in a pig pen, finally came to himself. He said, I know what I'll do. I will go home and I will tell my father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's exactly what he did. And he came home and you know what? That his sins were forgiven. But he was a type of a carnal Christian, not the type of a sinner. So as a believer, he came before the Lord and before his father and confessed his sins. And those sins were forgiven him. Those that hindered him, opened him up for more sin, opened him up for destruction here in life. But again, did not keep him out of heaven because you're gonna have a lot of carnal Christians that end up in heaven. Why? Because they were a Christian. And their carnality keeps them from receiving great rewards in heaven. And this is what we're coming back to. You know, as a pastor, I saw many Christians come for counseling who had sinned. They finally were ready to admit it. At first, they tried to cover their sins. They blamed other people. And then surrounding their original sin was even more sins on top of that. Carnality always breeds more carnality. But by the time they came to see me, much time had passed and they could not remember, much less name, all the sins that had been added to the first one. God wasn't saying that. If you'll confess the sin you know about, he's faithful and just to forgive you the sin you know about, but then he'll go ahead and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Was God holding them accountable to name each one? The answer is no. David's sin did not begin with Bathsheba. But in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses one and two, David's sin began by staying home when he should have gone with his troops to battle. And he probably invented some good, quote, reasons. No, they were excuses. But laying there in bed, in other words, all the troops were gone. There was no men left in town except for the ones that were guarding the front gate. That city was filled with women and children. And so he laid in bed. In fact, the Bible says he got off his bed after sleeping all day. He'd been sleeping, went to the balcony, saw a woman bathing. Why you say, well, why was she bathing in public? Because the men were all gone. She didn't know the king stayed home. He lusted after her, brought her to his bedroom, had sex with her, got her pregnant, and then brought her husband home, trying to get him drunk so he would go to bed with her and then blame the baby on him. David wasn't thinking about Bathsheba or her husband. He was only thinking about himself. As a faithful soldier, he would not go to his home and go to her, but stayed with a few guards at the gate. And David still tried to cover his sins and had Uriah, her husband, murdered. Nine months later, an illegitimate child was born to both of them. And the whole thing was after a year of sin, after a year of lying, after years of de- uh, another year of denial, David was confronted by Nathan the prophet. You know, it seems like ministers get the worst problems. You know, they get the worst things they have to do. And here this minister had to go and tell David his sin, which at any moment, David could have just cut off Nathan's head. God knew David had sinned. Jesus knew David had sinned. The Holy Spirit knew he had sinned. And now the prophet Nathan knew he had sinned. And there was only one thing to do. He had to say the same thing. David repented of his sin. David confessed his sin. And literally the meaning of the word to to confess means to say the same thing. God knows it. Jesus knows it. The Holy Spirit knows it. Now Nathan knows it. And now David has to say the same thing. And David didn't list his sins. He didn't say, Lord, forgive me for staying home. Lord, forgive me for being lazy and not studying your word. Lord, forgive me for seeing her and then lusting after her. Lord, forgive me for... Oh, he didn't go down the list of things. He just simply said, I have sinned against the Lord. That's 1 John 1, 9 admitting it, I have sinned against the Lord. And he later on added toward God, the same thing that the uh, prodigal did, I have sinned against heaven and against you, Father. He admitted it, he acknowledged his sin. Nathan immediately said, your sins are forgiven, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13, and a year's worth of sins were cleansed in one moment. That's grace. When the prodigal came home, he didn't tell his father how much money he had gone through, how many prostitutes he slept with, how many times he got drunk, or the names of all the bars he had been in. He simply said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. This is Luke chapter 15 and verse 21. He admitted or acknowledged his sin. He said the same thing and was restored to fellowship with his father and had his privileges restored. The first thing the father did was got him shoes, put a robe on his back, had a party plan for him. And so that's the beauty of it. But we're also told in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive it and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What about unknown sins? I like to think of it this way. 
You know, if the only way for your car to stay clean all the time is to leave it in the car wash. Once it's clean and you start to drive off, you're gonna get dirt on it again, but you have to come back to the car wash. First John 1, 9 is like a car wash. We can't live in there all the time. We go out and we get, you know, covered uh, with dirt. We get sins from the world and we go back to First John 1, 9. But once we get our car blasted there, all of the dirt is taken off. We may not be able to see the dust until we stand in the, in the light and see it just the right way. And so again, we need to get rid of that. And so when you go to get the big smudges off, the big dirt off, the mud off the tires, the wheels and off the hood, it might've bounced off. Then once we do that, then all this other stuff we can't necessarily see is gone. When we acknowledge what we know, that we have sinned against God, he's faithful to also forgive us for what we don't know those sins surrounding the first. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness as a display of his great mercy. And we're told in Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper. This is not a sinner. A sinner is not held accountable for his sins. He's held accountable for one thing. What did you do with Jesus Christ? Those names, Revelation 21, those names not found in the book of life were cast in the lake of fire. There's only one sin that separates a person from heaven, rejecting of Jesus Christ. And there's only one sin that gets you into heaven once you confess it, and that is accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Once you do that, you're in heaven. Jesus is the dividing line between heaven and hell, the dividing line. And if you accept him as Lord and Savior, your name is in the book of life, you go to heaven. If you reject him, you go to hell. And in other words, there's gonna be people in hell who are moral people, moral unbelievers. Maybe didn't commit a whole lot of sins, but they're not in hell because of their sins. They're in hell because they rejected Jesus Christ. There's gonna be Christians in heaven who go there with sins in their life and they'll be held accountable for that at the judgment seat of Christ and they're gonna forfeit rewards. So the sins you commit as a believer open you up to attacks in life, but they also hinder your rewards in heaven, but you're still going to heaven because you confess Jesus as Lord. You are not a sinning sinner as you were before you were saved. You were a sinning believer and God looks at it totally different. Now you approach him as a priest, not as a sinner. And he who covers his sin, Proverbs 28, 13 again, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Here we have Proverbs 28, 13, saying exactly the same thing as 1 John 1, 9, if we believers confess our sins. He's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we come back to that. And when we come back from the break, we're gonna talk about the difference between your spirit and your soul and how 1 John 1, 9 actually talks about that and penetrates that and will explain that. In the meantime, the offer is coming to you. And again, I want you to pick up a copy of this. And that is the flash drive of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John because so much revolves around that, but it will bring great victory into your life, great cleansing into your life, great freedom into your life, and great mental uh, release from these things to where they're not binding you, holding you down anymore. The moment that you look back at them, you say, I confess them. They're separated from me and I'll never be brought up again. And if I confess it again, because I've committed it again, it'll be forgiven again. This is the grace and mercy of God. See you right after the break. John's gospel was written as a testimony of Jesus as the Christ and as a guide for unbelievers to come to him as their savior. But the epistles of John, his three letters written to the church, are for guidance and strengthening to believers and church leadership who are facing troubling issues with false prophets, Gnostic heresies, and the pride that can invade the church, causing confusion and distress. John's epistles comfort believers with encouragement to continue doing right, stay in faith, be confident in Christ, and to love other believers as part of one family. In these 16 lessons, Pastor Bob Yandian makes the complicated simple with a verse-by-verse teaching and commentary of the three epistles of John. Topics include forgiveness of sin, what it means to know God, advancing in the Word, overcoming the world, spiritual maturity, and the sin unto death. To order the Epistles of John, visit bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus. 
were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. You and I are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. This is brought out in the book of Thessalonians. This is the three parts of us. The three parts of us, spirit, soul, and body, they're lined up in that direction for this reason because we're saved from the inside out. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your spirit, becomes completely clean. God cleanses your spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live there and you are going to heaven because your spirit has been born again. But what brings success in life is the next part that needs to be cleansed and that's your soul. Where your spirit was instantly cleansed, all sins forgiven, Holy Spirit moved in. The soul is a process. This is brought out in chapter 12 of the book of Romans and there it's called the renewing of the mind. You learn to change your thinking. Now you, through the rest of your lifetime, you replace the mind of Bob with the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is the word of God. This is what makes you a disciple. This is what brings you into spiritual maturity. Once you are born again, yes, Jesus lives in you. Yes, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But now to start acting like it, you need to take the word of God. This is all simply brought out in chapter eight of the book of John. Jesus there is ministering to sinners. And while he is speaking, he suddenly realizes the word of knowledge. Many of the Jews he is preaching to are believing in him as Lord and Savior. And he stops. And he said to those Jews which just believed in him, now, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He switches from understanding and salvation to knowing. You'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. It's not the truth that makes you free, it's knowing the truth that makes you free and applying it to that situation. Just because you have a Bible in your home and you have tons of them with different translation doesn't mean they're going to deliver you out of every situation. If you are a believer, is taking it off the page, putting it into your heart, then acting on it. And that's what Jesus meant. He said to those who just believed in him now, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. When you get born again and your spirit is born again, you are a convert. You are a Christian. But after that, you need to become a disciple and a disciple is one who continues in the word of God every day. So the redeeming of your spirit is instantaneously, the salvation of your soul is progressive and gets better day by day. The last part of you that will be redeemed is your body and that will be instantaneous like your spirit was, but that's going to happen at the return of Jesus Christ for the church, this mortal bam, will suddenly put on immortality. This corruptible, bam, will put on incorruption. It will be a natural body turned into a spiritual resurrection body. So in other words, the part that we need to deal with in life is our soul. The soul is what we're working on. And this is it. When you as a Christian sin, you don't sin in your spirit, you sin in your soul. It's impossible to sin in your spirit. And you become a believer and you have a soul, but if you sin, you become a believer who at that point is carnal. And because your soul did not go the way of the Holy Spirit or the word, your soul has hooked itself up with your body and now you are called a carnal Christian. The word carnal means carne, comes from uh, the Greek word, and also we get carne in the uh, Spanish language, meaning meat. It means you're under the control of your meat. And this is your meat, your body. You're under that control of that. And so you become a carnal Christian under the control of the flesh, but you're still a Christian. And listen, what happens is the moment you sin, the Holy Spirit just folds his arm. He still lives in you, but refuses to take control because you have turned the control of your life over at that moment to your flesh. And you are now living as a carnal, fleshly Christian, what's God waiting on for you to confess your sin? Father, forgive me. Father, I confess this. The moment you do that, the flesh loses control and the Holy Spirit can now take over again. You have just switched from being a carnal Christian to a spiritual Christian, a fleshly Christian to one under the control of the Holy Spirit who lives in your human spirit. And now you can truly begin to grow. So this is what happens. And when we confess our sins as a Christian, we confess what we know of, we know in our soul. This is what, so the Bible says the soul that sinneth as a believer. 
And we're talking to believers, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's talking about that you're going to lead to things that uh, the, the soul itself will never completely die is what's thing there is. Whatever you do will die. The works that your soul has produced, all that's going to die because you are not being controlled by the Holy Spirit who adds life to everything that you do. So it simply comes back to this again that the soul grows in the Christian life, but the soul also is where you sin. You make a decision and you sin and it affects your soul. There's a blot on the soul. It needs to be cleansed out of there. Your spirit's already clean. It was clean the moment you received Jesus, but there's cleansing that needs to happen in your soul. And the moment you confess it, it's over and you're back under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so this is what God wants. That's why you're called a spiritual Christian. Finally, which part of our being are we responsible for to keep it clean? It's not our spirit. That was cleansed when we were born again. You will never need to make it clean again. The blood of Jesus washed your spirit and you never need to wash it again. But the blood of Jesus that washed your spirit one time needs to cleanse your soul day by day. And that's why, again, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. This is found in the Psalms. And what the Lord is simply saying is, you are going to sin from time to time. But when you take God's word and hide it in your heart, where you hide it is within your soul. It's what you fall back on when you're tempted. And believe me, your flesh will tempt you to sin. But temptation is not a sin. Yielding to temptation is a sin. Jesus proved that when confronted three times by Satan, tempting him, real temptations. Jesus could have said yes to the devil and forfeited everything that he came to do here on this earth. But when tempted by Satan, Jesus fell back all three times on the word and said, it is written, it is written, it is written. No wonder we are to hide his word in our heart that when tempted, we might not sin against God. But if we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and we have 1 John 1, 9. How important that once you do sin, if you do sin, and probably you will, immediately take it to the Lord. Go, oh, Bob, you blew it. And Father, I confess that sin to you right now. And your flesh only had a momentary split second victory. It's now turned back over to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, thank you. And again, takes control of your life. The blood of Jesus washed and cleansed your spirit the moment of the new birth. You'll never need to wash it again. But as Christians... We do not and cannot sin in our spirit. 1 John 3, 9 tells us it's impossible. We sin in our soul. We sin in our thoughts. And this leads to words and eventually into action. The same blood that cleansed you in your spirit and you became born again now cleanses you in your soul. I like to think of it this way too. In Throughout the word of God, we've got comparisons. The Red Sea is a type of salvation, but when they came into the into the desert and water came out of that rock, that's a type of 1 John 1, 9. The difference being at the Red Sea, a lot of water. And the water that came out of the rock, a little water compared to the Red Sea. Uh, we have the story that Jesus talked about uh, with his disciples in the book of John, where he told his disciples, he said, I'm not gonna wash your feet. And Peter screamed out, no, 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 no. He said, wash me all over. I need to be washed all over. And Jesus said, no, when you're washed all over, you're, you're a Christian, but after that, you only need your feet washed. In other words, he took the analogy from the Old Testament and the priests. When the priest got up in the morning and was headed toward the uh, tabernacle or the temple, what they did was they took a shower, they took a bath, they washed all over. And then when they walked over to the place where they were going to officiate outside the Holy of Holies in the holy place out here, and in the side of the congregation, there was a, a place there where they were to wash their feet off. It was a laver and they got in and they washed their feet off. Why? Because the house where they lived in, the home where they lived in over to here, only their feet touched the ground and their feet needed to be cleaned. You understand the analogy? When I got born again, I'm washed all over. But it's the, the basically 1 John 1, 9 is like foot washing. I've been walking in this world. My feet have got dirty, much like when you walk on the beach. You've been out there swimming in the ocean. You walk on the beach and before you go back to your room at your hotel, they have a place there you can wash your feet. You turn on this little shower deal and it washes and gets the sand off of your feet. First John 1, 9, as compared to an ocean when you got born again, you have the Red Sea in comparison to what came out of the rock. Here you have an analogy too of when you take a bath, it's lots of water, but when you wash your feet, it's just a little bit of water. Another analogy was this, the Red Sea is a type of salvation, but when they entered in uh, 
to the promised land, they went across the Jordan. The Jordan was running at that time. You couldn't get across it. It had to stop for to cross it, but it still wasn't as big as the Red Sea. I'm simply here to tell you, no sin you'll ever commit as a Christian will ever even compare to the new birth. The new birth is like an ocean of the cleansing of blood of Jesus Christ. But when you as a believer come and confess your sins, it's like the water that came from the rock. It's like washing your feet. It's also like crossing the Jordan River and your freedom lies on the other side. But you see, when they crossed the Jordan River, they were already believers. When they crossed the Red Sea, they left as a type of sinners and they crossed the Red Sea and they accepted Jesus and the, uh, their enemies were drowned behind them. And so again, it opened up and they went through and it closed back up after that. It takes the blood of Jesus to cleanse us in our souls as much as it did to cleanse our spirit at the point of the new birth. But the same element did both. Like Jesus told his disciples when he washed their feet, he who is bathed, that's the new birth, needs only to wash his feet, that's confession of sins, but is completely clean. Bathing takes place one time, Foot washing may take place many times. Water is needed in both cases, as is the blood of Jesus needed in both cases. Salvation is for heaven and our relationship with God, but confession of sins is for time, fellowship with God, and daily victory in the life over Satan. So enjoy the grace of God. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater today. Grace is a wonderful doctrine. I love the grace of God. Believe in the message of grace and believe that it's one of the major emphasis for the hour we are living in that's being emphasized by God. But excesses do not negate the truth. The sinful excesses of many evangelists did not negate the healing movement. The excesses of shepherding years ago did not negate the truth of the charismatic movement and true proper leadership within a church. The excesses of prosperity today do not negate the truth of the message of faith and the message that God wants to prosper us in this lifetime. Every movement simply moves toward excesses at one time or another, or a group within it takes it to excess, Come back, don't throw out the baby with the bath water. Again, take the truth of 1 John 1, 9. And like these other movements, the truth of grace will find its point of balance. Let's enjoy the grace of God together. Let's enjoy the fact that when you as a sinner come before the Lord, it's grace and faith that makes you a child of God. But after you're saved, if you commit a sin. It's no more works that you have to come before the Lord there than it was at salvation. The same grace that saved you is now the same grace that's gonna remove your sin. All you have to do like you did back there was open your mouth and confess your sin. And as a priest before your heavenly father, stand on the grace of God. I don't have to come and, and bow, scrape, go to church more, give bigger offerings. I just take that sin and confess it. And God promised he's faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and then cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What a great, simple truth. What a powerful message. Thanks for joining me today. I will see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.